Steve got dinner, falls your ass, goody, claw, Ella, and show air on Clay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another video here on On Clay. It's another weekend review show. I'm joined once again by Matthew Hurley, the Gaelic stats man, friend of the show. And we're going to jump in to what was, Matthew, another bumper weekend of championship action. I mean, we had LGV action, we had the GA action, and we had hurling action as well. I mean, where to even start with this? Exactly, yeah. Thanks for having me on again, Seamus. Um, yeah, just tired after the weekend, really. Like, yesterday was, for me anyway, it was uh, going down to Killarney and watching Cork and Kerry. It wasn't too bad of a uh, beating afterwards. Um, and then Sunday today was absolutely hectic with games because you had the Waterford and Cork game on. You then had uh, Mayo Ross Common on the background. Didn't end up to be much. And Toronto and Cavan going to extra time later on today. And I just said, you know what, Cork and Waterford finished. I may as well kick it to extra time and just... So disappointed Cavan kind of threw it away at the end. But um, but look, it was a hectic weekend of action. Kind of hard to keep track of all of it. I tried my best to do it, as you do, I'm sure, as well. But um, yeah, just a mental weekend. And uh, I suppose it was a weekend as well, particularly in football, where um, we were so down about the provincial championships last weekend. This weekend, there was one game where it was just a foregone conclusion and cleared Watford. But the rest of the games kind of epitomised the provincial championships might be here to stay. So, um, yeah, love to get um, get into the action with you here. Yeah, no, I'm buzzing to get into it now. We have a couple of comments in here. Killian McMullen says, Ulster is king. What a weekend, certainly. I mean, the two games in Ulster, the two Ulster quarterfinals were two crackers. And then Jerry Regan, of course, regular guest of the show, tweets in here saying, random staff view today is the first time Waterford have won back-to-back -back Munster hurling matches since 2007. But of course, taking into account their victory over Tipperary at the end of last year's Munster Championship. Jer, of course, is a proud Clareman. Jer, I hope you're holding up well, <laughs> because that is the first game we're going to start with. Clare, 118, Limerick, 315. I watched this game. I know you did stats for this game, guys. Go follow Matthew's page. I don't know how you wouldn't at this stage, but go follow his page. He does the stats on all, literally all the games. Such a reliable source of information for anything you want to do that's GA related. And in this game, Matthew, my overriding feeling watching this, how on earth did Limerick win this game? How on earth did Clare lose this game? It felt like in the space of five minutes, Clare went from being comfortable to guarantee that they were going to lose this game. And I, like at full time, it was like Limerick won, but I've no idea how they won. I have no idea how they got away with that one. Like it really feels like Claire let them off the hook. Yeah, definitely. Like it was just a weird, weird game. Uh, Claire did very well in the first half, to be fair to them. And it had a thing, it had the sense when Tony Kelly was coming onto the pitch that Claire kind of had this wrapped up. And it was almost mm -hmm. like that the big hurrah, Tony Kelly coming onto the pitch and Clare are going to go on and win the game. But just a free goal from Derwood Burns. I don't know, could you give it to Dur Dur Derwood Burns or Aaron Galan? Look, for now, I'll give it to Derwood Burns. But it was just a free nature of a, of a goal straight from the free and went all the way into the net. The Donegal Dolly goal, it was well taken, I have to say. But the, and the, then the Aaron Galan third, the third goal was absolutely a freak as well. Because it mm. went straight from the puck out. Limerick went straight out the other end. Garrod Hagerty going straight through on goal. Hits off the post. And is there an inkling of a square ball there? Obviously, I'll have to watch the replay. Obviously, hurling is so quick. So, we can't really um, distinguish in real time. Was it a square ball or not? I'll have to look at it in the Sunday game once again this evening. But my first instinct of a Seamus. And to be honest, I do go to college in Limerick. And I do, um, um, you know articles for Drive for Five and things like that. I did speak to TJ Ryan who was coincidentally on the promo today for yeah. RT. So so yeah. Uh, but at the same time, Seamus, I from first glance it was a square ball. I mm -hmm. think it was a square ball uh, for Aaron Galan's goal. Wayne Garrett Hagerty hits it by the looks of it, Galan's in the square. And could Claire have something you know, up their sleeve about that with uh, referee decisions later on today. I know the referees decisions and things like that with Claire haven't been the friendliest of um, of uh, compar comparables over the last two seasons, especially against Limerick. But I think Clare fans will have a lot to say about that decision in particular. And um, and yeah, it was just a weird, weird game. Um, and Limerick in the first half were terrible in shooting. Yeah. I think they had nine wides in the first half, which was unheard of from a Limerick team. Uh, yeah, they're honest, they, man, they were, they were playing like they were hung over to bits. Like, I literally was watching, like, these lads look like they're fresh off the beach. Like, they look like they've 
nowhere near the pace. You're seeing like Keen Lynch, Dermot Burns hit a free, nowhere near the target. And you're like, this is stuff that we've never seen from these lads before. And you are right that like when you're in a situation like that, you need that bit of luck to kind of just ignite your your fighting spirit again. And when Burns' shot went into net, a part of me was thinking, of course that's happened. Just of course that's happened because like Claire, the next step that is going to happen to stop Claire from beating Limerick is now we're just short of a UFO pulling up in front of the goal and a few aliens popping off to help Nicky Quaid stop a shot from Tony Kelly. Like literally it seems like anything that could have possibly stopped them from beating Limerick over the last few years seems to have stopped them obviously apart from when they beat them last year but i was thinking when that when that shot went into the net like i was just like ah oh, for god's sake and then like the second goal went in from odalic and look while it was he took it okay i still think quilligan should have saved it and i also think the clear defenders probably should have dealt with it in the first place so again i think that's another goal that claire should have got rid of and then lastly the last one from gilan you're right uh, free out but interestingly we have a comment in here from Jer, proud Claire and he says no complaints from Claire about the square ball we collapsed and shouldn't have been in that position and like the, the truth is is that that's what changed as well is that it spun so quickly from Claire being completely in pole position completely dominant to it, it just seemed inevitable then that Limerick were going to win yeah, exactly. But another kind of um, uh, facet to the game li- leading into the latter stages and that why Clare looks so open and things like that. This could be something small, but Conor Cleary and Adam Hogan were both on bookings. So mm-hmm. one more step out of the line and he, they were off. So obviously that affected Cork. We'll get on to Cork and Waterford a bit. But, um, but yeah, that could have been another kind of um, thing for Clare not to tackle rashly. Um, it just their defence was all over the place in the last few minutes, and they looked so good against Kilkenny in particular. Adam Hogan was absolutely outstanding. I just feel that yellow card in the first half kind of got him off a bit, and it, mm-hmm. it kind of stopped them fouling, stopped them tugging Galan because he knew one more step out of line and he was off the pitch. So that could have been another um facet to the game. But um, but yeah, it was poor ops as really. Look at the first half, Limerick were an absolute mess attack boys and defence boys. Like attack boys, they hit nine whites and they didn't look like, as you said previously, they looked like they were home over. They looked like they were just off the beach. They looked like nothing was going right for them. And defensively as well, 48 McCarthy goal, they looked so open in the back. Like it was straight from a puck out. And it was just it just looked very, very easy from um from a clear a clear point of view to was into the in, um towards the goal. And then like Limber did open in the second half, but at no stage of the second half, up until that free goal from Dermot Burns, did I think Limber could go on and win it. But that again, that is the team what Limber are. If they perform badly, like they did against Kilkenny last year, when you think about the Paddy Egan's goal, I thought they were gone. Simply gone. Mm. They were five points down. There's no way they're coming back into that this all over the final. And they did produce a brilliant performance. But the weird thing is, this wasn't, I don't think, a vintage Limerick performance. I just think yeah, some, yeah. things went things went right for them in the last 10 minutes. And it was just a freak um, you know, set of events that got them over the line. And yeah, it was just unexpected how it happens. And I seen an image recently of the RT scoreboard. I think within a minute, it was 116 to 114. And then the next minute, <laughs> about seconds later, it was 116 to 314. And you're like, what on earth has happened here? Like, I, I'd imagine for anybody that didn't, that didn't watch the game, they must imagine, have been looking at that. Popped out, imagine you popped out to the toilet for two minutes and came back in. Like, or you just went to get a cup of tea and so you came back in and the entire game has turned on its head. You see Tony Kelly come in, you're like, oh, I'll just pop in and get a sandwich or something. Back in, Limerick are, have hit two goals. I mean, that's the type of team that they are. We've come in here from Joseph Nash. He says, what is it with Wexford struggling against Dublin every year? Yeah, we'll get to that later. I, I'm, I'm almost tempted to start calling this the annual Dublin-Wexford draw. It happens every single season. Either either one team wins by a point or they draw, and they usually draw. Like it, to my memory, I'd, I'd I'd love to actually see the stat, but to my memory, it feels like they always draw. <laughs> like no matter what goes on. So then that's why it's mad for me that you see Wexford going and beating Kilkenny and Dublin. We can't seem to get anywhere near them. But um, back to the Clare Limerick game, like. 
what must Brian Lohan be thinking? This is kind of the last question I'll have on it. What must Brian Lohan be thinking? Because they were talking about it after and they were saying, now Clare are on the back foot. They are. They still have to get by Cork, who now obviously have lost to Waterford. That's a dangerous game. Waterford have shown that they're no mugs. That's a dangerous game. Tipperary as well are good this year under Cahill. They've definitely improved. Like, Clare, all of a sudden, from one defeat in a game where they really should have won, you know, a couple more slip-ups and they're gone. So, like, how does Lohan rally the troops from here? It's going to be a hard one to judge. And um, I suppose leading into the Cork and Waterford game and uh, they formed the Cork around. Like, I think Richie Hogan mentioned it brilliantly on the uh, GA Go today. Brilliant coverage, by the way, of GA Go. Definitely recommend a subscription there. But um, but Richie Hogan actually said Claire would be crestfallen after today. It was almost like they performed so well and they lost somehow. Mm -hmm. Whereas Cork actually performed badly and like, at the same time, like Cork would go into the game thinking, we need to improve here, lads. We need to up our game. And Claire would be thinking, what more do we need to up our game on did, to improve? Did Clare perform well? I'm just going to... just If you want to discuss that, I think they performed way better in previous meetings against Limerick. I just think Limerick were awful. I think Limerick were worse than they were. Because Claire did only score 118. Like, that's not... Yeah them at their free-flowing best. I think Limerick just kind of... It was like it was like saying that you're expecting, you know, the most pure boxer match and it was, you know, two, uh, two lads swinging down an alleyway like or something that Limerick just managed to pull themselves together a little bit more at the end to get over the line. And you mm -hmm. would like... You would think Claire must be sitting there thinking we could have played better. Surely we could have played better in the last 15 minutes and got over the line when Limerick were there for the taking. I suppose, like, even look at um, stats now today from shots for play, clear at 47%, which isn't really good enough. Yeah. Um, and to be fair, Limerick at 46% as well, but it was just such a thrilling game that it probably masked over the fact that the quality wasn't there today. Mm -hmm. Probably. Um, I, ju I just think it... Joseph opposed this to you. Joseph says Limerick started today as they finished versus Kilkenny. Is this win only covering over Limerick cracks? I think they've got over their toughest turtle now today, so I think they'll get out of Munster pretty easy. Like today was a dangerous game for them. If they lost today, they would have gone gone into the next game. I think it's against Tipperary. I'm not entirely sure. Is it Cork? Under I think it's Cork. I'm not sure, to be honest. I'll have to have a look at it. I think Watford, I heard of GA Gore playing in two weeks' time against Tip, so I was just joining the dots. I think they're playing Tip next week. I'll have to have a look again. But um, but I think today was a massive game for both sides. If they mm -hmm. lost this game, they're suddenly under the cosh. And I know it's the first game and all of that, but you look at the pressure Clare under now next week. Like, that is instant pressure. You know, Tip and Limerick next week, yeah. Now you, you kind of thought that, but... Like that that would have been pressure for Limerick if they lost to them. Yeah. So they got over the line. They go into the next game now, and it is on the Gaelic grounds, and um, because of home and away agreement next week. So, like Limerick will now go into the Tipperary game feeling a lot more confident about themselves. And and uh, we're doing as well. Sean Finn actually didn't start the game, and once he came in, Limerick started to steady up a small bit as yeah. well. That was kind of a positive. But um, Daryl Donovan, he's not there for the first two games. Once they ride that storm, if they get two wins on the board, I think that would be a brilliant uh, sign for Limerick. And I think Pond that's actually mentioned on RT today, I think it was Joe Canning actually mentioned it on the Sunday game, that Limerick need to be knocked out in Munster. If they're not knocked out in Munster, they're a dangerous yeah, animal yeah, going yeah. to Rock Park. So, so well, last really year it was way easier them. for them to finish out the All-Ireland than it was to get out of Munster. Yeah. Yeah, when you look at the games, Galway, Kilkenny, like they, they don't, they're not really. I, I know it's Leinster hurling and there's the Leinster versus Munster boys and things like that, but Leinster hurling's not on the not on the pedestal of Munster hurling. When you look at it, like Clare, Tip. I know Tip lost to Galway last year, but honestly, I think Tip just dropped the ball against Galway. I think Tip are still mm -hmm. a better team. So, so yeah, um, I, I just well, think the team hasn't it, won the All Ireland since 2017. So, yeah, I mean, there you that's, go. That's the proof of the pudding. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's just the monster championship. It's cutthroat. If Limerick get knocked out, no, that's the only way they're going to get knocked out. If they get to Crow Park, um, into a quarter final or a semi final, 
there's no stopping them then. Yeah, no, definitely. We have a couple more comments in here. So we've one more from Jay. Jay says, believe it or not, Wexford have only beaten Dublin once in the round robin. So uh, yeah. Dublin seemed to be a bit of a bogey team for Wexford to come up against. Uh, Joseph says here as well, it was ve- it was the very good players of Waterford who won today, not Davies' tactics and training. So obviously we'll get into that game next because Waterford did have the victory over Cork. One that I didn't really see coming, to be honest. Waterford 225, Cork 125 in Walsh Park. Now, it's a great win for Waterford. And it really, really meant a lot for Davey. You could see at the end, like him falling to his knees there. Like, I mean, because he has been under, you know, intense scrutiny. A lot of people saying like that the, him and this Waterford team are washed up now and nobody's expecting anything. And people saying it's a guarantee that they're going to finish bottom of the Munster group. So this win, with his back firmly against the wall, it was really, really important. Big win, huge. And what we questioned in the podcast during the week was Turk Water, because Davey talked about that in the league, and I watched that close in the second half. Yes, Cork had a bit of a run of them at the early stages of the second half. It looked like they were coming back into it. They leveled at one stage, but Waterford rolled out that start brilliantly. They did really, really well. And even they were drawing the game, and then they get the penalty. The penalty... I will say it's it's a tight one. It is a tight decision because when you look at it um, with uh, the Waterford player going straight through and going to Kieran Joyce following them, the ball's already gone. So mm-hmm. could you say that is a clear goal scoring opportunity when the ball's already uh, left the palm of his hand? I, like it, it's again, it's the interpretation of the rule. Look, I will say Waterford just wanted it more today. They mm-hmm. wanted them, like in the first half, they were well up for it. Even after Jamie Barron's goal, they still, you know, were relentless against Cork. And Cork just looked very sloppy in the first half. Conor Lee Han was really, really poor. Patrick Harkin would play, wasn't up to his usual standards. Seamus Harden was very, very quiet. Like, other than Darrell Fitzgibbon in that first half, Cork were really, really poor. And that is a worrying sign for Pat Ryan's team. Weirdly enough, actually, in the game, Cork had a 50 percent shot accuracy in the first half. In the second half, they had 89 percent. They did well in the second half in shooting. Yeah. The problem was they didn't do it throughout the entire game. And that decision as well, I'm sure you'll have your opinions on it, Seamus, but to me, it just looks a bit of a dodgy decision. Look, fair play to Waterford, brilliant win for them. And it puts Cork now on the back foot and Clare themselves as well, because that game at Parky, Super Valley Parky Keith next Sunday is huge now. Yeah, like, I'd be kind of on the same level as yourself. Like, I think if the ball is gone, I don't know how you can say that it's a definite goal scoring opportunity. And, like, the, a decision like that does have a massive impact on the game, it has a massive impact on the mentality of the players and everything like that. And it definitely was a turning point. Um, Joseph asks here, I'll put this to you, Matthew. Joseph says, Did the black card kill the cork comeback? Yes. No doubt about it, it did. I, I think actually Cork uh, got a few points, but I think what really set us gone was the red card for Damien Cahill and the second yellow card. And don't, no mistake about it, it was a red card. And uh, it was a hard one to take for Cork. But yeah, I think Cork did really, really well in the second half and they weathered the storm really well. And then the penalty comes, the black card comes. And as well as that, you're missing Kieran Joyce out of the team as well, who's kind of Cork's rock in the back yeah. line. So that was a big loss for them. Um, I would He's say, but been huge since they found him. Yeah, he he was, he, and he is no doubt about it. But um, I would say, look, it was tough decisions on Cork today, and you know, on another day they could have gone and um, for for Cork and against Waterford. But the first half performance, in particular for Pat Ryan's team, wasn't good enough. Simply wasn't. Fifty percent shot accuracy was really really poor. They looked very open defensively. They were bullied by Watford. Really, Caleb Lyons around the middle was absolutely brilliant. Neil Montgomery, Jamie Barron had the game of his life. But I would say Carr kind of made it a bit too easy for them in that first half, and that was a bit worrying from a Carr point of view. It wasn't the Carr that we seen during the league, and another kind of disappointing thing from Carr point of view. Even when they were dragging Watford back, there was no onus to go for goals if you know what I mean, from certain players. There was from Alan Connolly when he got that goal, but it was too little too late. And mm-hmm. I think we needed to put the ball in more to Alan Connolly because when you've seen this with players like Patrick Horgan, with um, with Sean Toomey in the first half, with, with Robbie O'Flynn in the second half, they all kind of went for points and they didn't have the braveness to go for the kill. 
And Waterford had the bravest to go for the kid. Michael Coyley could have got a goal in the first half. Jamie Barron got one. Stephen Bennett was running straight through goal all day. Daisy Hutchins was causing a few problems. And what I will say about Waterford, Davey got his tactics. And we don't usually say this on podcasts. Davey got his tactics spot on today. He let the Waterford players do the work. What he did basically, like he put D- Daisy Hutchins around the middle of the field last year. And you're thinking... He's our most explosive attacker. Why are you putting him around the middle of the field? He's well capable of um, you know, shooting on size and taking on his man. Davy just let him off the leash today and he mm. scores 10 points. That's yeah. not a coincidence. That is, you know, a smart bit of play. And Davy should have done that last year. But coincidentally, actually, in the post match interview, if you've seen it, Seamus, he was on his knees and stuff like that. But in the post match interview, he was saying, Look, we have another game next week. There's nothing won yet. I'm thinking you were absolutely ecstatic one on camera on shot, and now you're saying yeah, okay, yeah. it's an, it's just another game. I think you that's know. just because like the pressure he's been under, man. I feel like people have really been, you know, harsh. Like, a lot of people have been saying that they're they're rolled off. Like there's no way that they're going to even win a game in Munster. Everybody was saying that you know they're finishing rock bottom, four defeats out of four. That's the guaranteed two points for everybody to pick up in Munster. And like you would, you would have been searching pretty hard to find somebody who would have put Waterford in the top three before the Munster Championship began. So I think like that's why I think he's feeling that bit of pressure off him because the way it finished at Wexford wasn't great, you know, especially considering that the highest the highs that they experienced in 2019, 2020 was very poor, and 2021 wasn't great either. And then you know he has the year with the Komogi Cork team with the Cork Komogi team. And then he goes back into Waterford. And I think he is feeling that kind of last roll of the dice feel. Because, you know, me and you were talking about it. We were saying, I don't really know where he goes after Waterford. I don't see Claire taking him back. I don't, especially at like his rivalry with Brian Lohan. I just I don't see that being a, a smooth transition of power. Um, then on top of that, like he's not going to Cork. He's not going to like, he's not going to Galway. Um like my thing is that I could I could have potentially seen him taking the reins with Dublin, like to, to draw some interest in and be a big name appointment and everything like that. And I think maybe that could still happen one day, but I think he has this feeling of last roll of the dice, which I think is why he's so emotional when Waterford do get on the board. But then I think it's like a matter of bring yourself back under control because you have you know work still left to do and then last question to you is where does this leave Cork because we obviously we're saying you know Claire I'm in the position now where you know they have to start picking up wins but Cork are right there with them and like it's crazy we were saying how much one win can can change the narrative around Waterford's campaign but how much one defeat can also change Claire and Cork's outlook on the rest of the Munster Championship now they're skating on far thinner ice yeah, exactly. I, I, I go as far as to say, Seamus, the loser next week on Sunday is out of uh, the Munster Championship. Mm-hmm. And I'll go as far as saying that. It's a crucial game now next week. And particularly for Clare, because Cork, like, there was fans, um, you know, back in their own county and things like that, saying that Lee McCarthy's coming back by Lee and things like that. And it, I think it was just more hope than expectation. But for Clare in particular, they were league champions a few weeks ago. They've been the closest challengers to Limerick over the last few seasons. And to many people, they're the second best team in the country. If they were to lose next week, like that would be so so unexpected, and a lot of people might be going on Brian Lowen's back after this. After, um, if they lose to Cork, but um, mm-hmm. at the same time, if you flip it, rules reverse. There was even uh, I was looking at the social media comments after um from the Cork um, Twitter pages and Instagram pages, and some of them were even saying Pat Ryan out. They were so disappointed after today. Yeah, that's mad. So. So imagine what will be the the attitude next week if they lose to Clare. Certainly, you know, yeah. so. Look, the reality is, man, like the Munster Championship is just absolutely insane because, like, just one result can just change your outlook of the season. I mean, like Limerick's it seemed like Clare had Limerick's number, and then I was watching the game, thinking, you know, where do where do Limerick go from here? They're on the ropes very early on with you know Cork, Tip, and Waterford all still to play. Then within two minutes, they get those two goals. They then turn it on Claire. And now you've got people who, as you said, might be looking at Claire being like, you shouldn't have gone for the league. You ran out of gas against Limerick and everything like that. And the comments again, the whole narrative changes around Claire. 
Cork the same and Waterford the same. Waterford were picked by everybody to finish bottom. Now they've won a game. Now their whole narrative changes. And Cork, as you said, much more pressure on Pat Ryan now that they've lost the opening game. So it's crazy how quick one game can just change the outlook of your upcoming season it is extraordinary and it is something that the monster championship is absolutely fantastic for because you do just never know what's coming next and um, we'll move over then to the leinster hurling championship and this game was obviously the pick of the bunch for being you know the most significant in terms of the result wexford 121 dublin 218 this is in wexford park two late goals by dublin danny sutcliffe and keno sullivan as Dublin snatch a draw against Wexford once again, Dublin and Wexford draw. As that comment in there by Jair said, Wexford have only actually beaten Dublin once yeah. in the round robin, which is extraordinary when you consider they've beaten Kilkenny and beaten Galway and everything like that. But against Dublin, they can't seem to get over the line. And when you see the, the results under Keith Rossiter and you see the progress that was being made, I honestly was tipping Wexford to win this game. But Dublin, again, showing the fight, showing the spirit under Michal Donoghue. It's a good point for Dublin away from home. It is, to be honest with you. But uh, even looking at it, without looking at the context of the game, I was thinking it's a better point for Wexford. You know what I mean? Because Wexford are more capable of beating Galway, uh, Kilkenny, whereas Dublin kind of went into the game having to win this game. Mm-hmm. because I don't think they're beating Kilkenny and I don't think they're beating Galway, just because I don't think Dublin have the belief to beat those sides. I think they're well capable of doing it, but I just don't think they have the belief to do it. And they're going back the to Jersey. game last year. The Galway game last year was a good step forward because we should have won that game. Did, did again, did Galway have much to play for? I can't remember. Like Honestly, off the top of my head, did they? I think they were already set in stone for a Leinster final, if I remember so correctly. So, yeah. Okay. So, like... But uh, it might be a different uh, scenario you now. I, I, I don't know about that. But um, even look, going back to Jor's comment, uh, I was looking at um, this website, Know the Game, and we were talking about uh, statistics, database of the G and stuff like that. And this this page in particular is really, really good, actually. Give it a follow on Twitter if you haven't already and click onto the website. I looked at Dublin and um, Wexford's meetings in the wrong Robin Like Jor did uh, with the comment, and he beat me to it there. Wexford have one win, Dublin have two wins, and there's been two draws in five games. That's from go. 2018 to 2024. That's included today. So, like that's a that's a poor record actually for Wexford to have. Um, a 20% win rate against Dublin. Um, it seems like Dublin kind of have Wexford's number in many ways. But even look at the context of the game and uh, doing reports and stuff like that. I looked at it and Dublin scored two goals in additional dr- time through Keane O'Sullivan and Danny Sutcliffe to snatch a draw away from Wexford. So it seemed like Wexford should have won the game, and, mm. but they didn't, and that was. Most of it a kick in the teeth, really, for Keith Rossiter. Because, like, if you if you are in a such a situation to win a game, you have to close it out. And it's just a tough one for Wexford to take. But a big result for Dublin, considering the context of the game. They were behind by uh, five or six points. They come back to draw it. I think it's a massive result for Dublin. But the question is, can they compete now with Galway and, um, and Kilkenny? And then, like, if Kilkenny and Galway beat both sides, so then it'll go down to score difference. So how much will Dublin put on Carlo and Antrim? That'll be crucial too. Yeah, definitely. We are commenting here from Stockroom. Tim, he says, huge week for Clare. Get a result against Cork and today's loss can be called a wake-up call. Lose and it could be game over. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the safety net if you like, is well and truly gone. Like, I mean, one more slip up and you really are out the door. Yeah, look, like going away to Exeter Park, you knew it was going to be a tricky game. And I do agree with you. Like, even though we have beaten Galway, say, in 2022, 2021 under Shane O'Neill, I remember that game. <clears throat> then you have other examples like the Croke Park game last year. Michal Dunne, whose last game was Galway boss, ironically, in 2019. Like, there is examples where we have beaten Galway there's not many fresh ones of us beating Kilkenny now, unfortunately, whereas Wexford on the other side have have shown that they can beat Kilkenny when it really matters. Um, so at this moment, I would still say probably advantage Wexford in terms of getting out of the group. I think they're more likely to pick up a result against Kilkenny and Galway. However, statistically, they're also more likely to absolutely bottle it against Antrim and Carlo. Like they're statistically yeah. more likely to completely shoot themselves in the foot so I think I'd still say it's a bit of a toss of a coin 
between these two teams to see who actually makes it out of the Leinster Championship alongside Kilkenny and Galway, who I will pair their games together. So Galway beat Carlow 225 to 214 in Pierce Stadium, and Kilkenny beat Antrim 530 to 13 points in Nolan Park. So, I mean, these results were highly, highly expected that it would go like this. But is there anything we can take from it? Like, obviously, Kilkenny's scoreline is way more eye-catching than, and than uh, Galway's one over Carlo. Obviously, 11-point victory for Galway there. For Kilkenny, I mean, how long have you got to add that up? <laughs> I mean, absolutely shocking scoreline there for Antrim to concede. But like, is there anything much we can take from those two games? Well, we'll see about the Galway Carlo game, but I was looking down in, in detail because I was doing a bit of scorekeeping for this. Uh, I will say that Carlo covered themselves in glory in this game. Uh, actually, the 51st minute, Marty Cavanagh got a goal and they were four points down. And Galway looked to be on the ropes and we were thinking, OK, is there a shock here? Brewing Carlo are doing pretty well. Then Conor Cody gets a goal and then, yeah, that's it. Uh, Galway are going to win the game. But Carlo did very well, in fairness. A lot of people tipped them to the bottom of the Leinster Championship. But they did. They covered themselves in glory. They did well. They fought with Galway to the bitter end. I don't know, is it down to Carlo performing that well? Or is it Galway being very, very sloppy? We'll have mm-hmm. to see in the Sunday game now tonight what was the actual issue there. But um, it was a decent um, um, performance from Carlo. They should be very proud of themselves going to the further into the Leinster Championship. A lot of work for Galway to do. But then again, Evan Nyland and Conor Whelan both came around and got points. They were on the bench today. So maybe if they start them there might be a different story in the Galway team. As for Kilkenny and Antrim, is there any point, really? Uh, five goals, 30 points. Yeah. That's all I can yeah, say. Good performance. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I will say, good performance from uh, Owen Wall, uh, scored 2-2 off the bench from O'Loughlin Gaze. But uh, other than that, I can't take much from this game, to be honest with you, Seamus. It was a bit of a procession. I don't think Derek Ling will either, to be honest. I think that's mm-hmm. job done. You got over that one. You did what you were supposed to do. There's tougher tests ahead. Uh, Joseph comments in here saying Dublin struggle versus Kilkenny. Kilkenny struggle versus Wexford. Wexford struggle versus Dublin. Figure that out. That's how the Leinster Championship works. Styles make fights. And I actually do think Dublin are have been a good stylistic matchup for Wexford in terms of Dublin have you know big physical players like your Chris Crummy, Zone O'Donnells, Danny Sutcliffe that actually do pose you know difficulties to Wexford. Wexford had the pace that poses difficulty to Kilkenny and Kilkenny have better skilled players than Dublin and the way they're able to ping the ball around. Dublin can't really do that as comfortably. So I think that kind of is why they all struggle with each other. Now, we're going to run through the other competitions uh, below the Lee McCarthy. So the John McDonough Cup kicked off this weekend. The three results, Leash 221, awfully 24 points in O'More Park. Westmead stunned by Kerry, 114, Kerry 120, and that was in Mullingar. Down beat Mead then 324 to 25 points. So brilliant starts for Down, for Leash, and for Kerry. The Kerry result is definitely the one that jumps off the page, though, as well as the Leash one, of course, beating Offaly. Yeah, exactly. It was a, a, bit, a bit of a shock to the Joe McDonough Cup, but uh, even look, I look at um, you know, the game there uh, for records and stuff like that for Wexford and Kilkenny. Since 2018, Wexford have actually won three games. Kilkenny have won two. Tell you all I need to know. Like, that was a, that's an amazing stat there. And um, like Wexford do struggle, or Kilkenny do struggle to beat, uh, to beat uh, Wexford. But in the Joe McDonough, I see it actually on Clubber. And Clubber, huge shout out for showing the game between uh, Leash and Offaly today. Absolutely brilliant, and it's great that they, you know, know what the fans want, and they show this hurling game. And I see a bit of a clip there. Offaly could have won it with the last puck of the game, and then Leash were going down the other end. They get the goal through Paddy Purcell. What scenes in Omar Park? A brilliant win for Leash. What I would say though, Adam Scree has scored eight points coming onto the pitch for Offaly, so big performance from him, and hopefully he will gain a bit of form in the Joe McDonough Cup. Massive result for Kerry. Big result for them. I wasn't expecting that, beating Westmead. Uh, Morris O'Connor scored 110, was a massive uh, showing from him. And a uh, brilliant win for Kerry. And it probably tips the Joe McDonough Cup um, upside down in many ways because many people thought Westmead would be up there contending for promotion. Why can't Kerry? Brilliant performance from them, even without Shane Conway in the team. So it shows that they can do it without their best players. And uh, the likes of Mikey Boyle even retiring in the off season, they were two huge losses for Kerry. And they still got the win today, so well done to them in general. And uh, for Down and Meads, probably an expected result down to win that game. And I think Meads 
could have a tricky end in the Drummond Donut Cup. They could have a, a sticky spell. Their manager left before the season even started. And yeah, it looks like they'll be in relegation bother. But Dahi's hands perform well with two goals and two points in this game. So good result for Don. But a uh, big weekend in uh, the Drummond Donut Cup. Yeah, certainly very interesting. I mean, the Westmead result is the main one. Like, I didn't see that coming. I really thought Westmead would have been locked in as favourites, especially when you see the former people like David Williams, etc. I thought they would have carried the experience of playing Division 1 teams into the John McDonough Cup. But Kerry really stung them early. Christy Ring had its round two. So we have Kildare put a beating on Wicklow, 327 to 14 points in Hawkfield. London did the same to Sligo and Royslip, 426 to Sligo's 12 points and Derry beat around 226 to 13 points in Owen Begg. So three very one-sided games. Exactly, yeah. And I think performance of the weekend uh, going through the hurry competitions, Jack Goulding for London, he scored two goals and 13 points, which is mm. absolutely insane. That's a you full-time know, score for a team. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And coincidentally, he's actually a former Kerry hurler. Um, he moved over to London to get job opportunities. So, like a, a big weekend for Kerry Hurling in particular. So, really, really good weekend for them. For Kildare, Jack Sheridan really starred for them. And, um, and, uh, Mar- uh, what's his name? The corner forward, Morris Curtin, I think it was number 13, got a very good score, one three from play for Kildare. And as for Tyrone, very good result for them as well. But, uh, Kildare and London, I think they'd be the two front runners in this. London have some very good players, the likes of Jack Gould, the likes of Ronan Crowley. And Kildare shouldn't be at this level, to be honest, in all honesty. They shouldn't have gone down last year. And I think, honestly, they are a Joe McDonough team. And with Brian Dowling there in charge, I think they're well favourites to go on and win it. But London have the forwards to trouble them later in the season. They do. Uh, I do agree with you. I think Kildare definitely are like the main ones that I look at and expect to get out. Players like Jack Sheridan, James Burke. I think they are too strong to be down there. The Nicky Rackard had its round two as well. Monaghan 116, Roscommon 417 and Inish Keane. Donegal 21 points, Mayo 14 points in letter Kenny and Armagh pipped loud in Dowdles Hill, winning by 18 points to 17. So they're round two of the Nicky Rackard. Closer games apart from the Roscommon one. That's an impressive win. Big win for Roscommon and a big win against a Monaghan team that went up for the Lorry Mar last season. So big win for Roscommon even to go to the Skeen and go on and win that game is brilliant. Um, as for Tony Gall, that was the shock of the weekend nearly for me because Mayo have been producing very good performances in the hurling over the last uh, year or so. But Tony Gall, they got two wins this weekend. They got to win in the football and they got to win in the hurling. So well done to them. Jory Gilmore for midfield was brilliant. Eight points. Uh, I think he got in midfield. So very good performance from him. And Armagh, very good win from him, uh, from them winning against Lowell. And Alex O'Boyle, I think, got a last minute a uh, point and he scored nine points overall for Armagh so a uh, very good performance from him in particular and uh, yeah good weekend in the Nicky Racker and then um, a team that I predicted would win at Mayo losing in the first two rounds who would have thought it? Certainly I mean it's a very very difficult one to predict these competitions like the <laughs> standard is certainly improving and then the lowest tier is the Laurie Mark Cup that round two happened Fermanagh and Cavan played out a brilliant game 5-12 to Fermanagh 3-18 to Cavan and Ennis Gillen Leitrim beat Lancashire 225-120 to 120 in Glenavy and Warwickshire beat Longford 221-216 to 216 in Birmingham. Very, very interesting games. Obviously, the one that jumps off the sheet there is Fermanagh's thrilling draw with Cavan. And obviously, there is the rivalry there between the two sides. So, uh, you know, this was an outstanding game where, where it looks with eight goals. Like that sounded like great fun in fairness. Um, I know Fermanagh has some very good players like Luca McCuster, but uh, I think it was Dan and McKeogh had a very good game for Fermanagh, scoring 1-5 in this game. So very good performance from him. Nick Kenny on the other end for Cavan, 10 points from him. And uh, yeah, really good uh, performance from both sides, but ultimately it is a draw. Cavan have done well over the last few seasons and Fermanagh themselves have very good players at this level. Uh, Warwickshire, very good result for them against Longford. And then Leitrim uh, winning against Lancashire, I think it was. Very good uh, win for them. And um, yeah, it's, it's the, the winners this weekend. And for Man and Cavan themselves up nicely to potentially get to a final in the Lorry Mark. Certainly does. And then that concludes our coverage on the hurling. So now we're going to move on to the football. And just to go back to a comment that we got at the very start from Gillian McMullen, he's obviously buzzing for it. He said Ulster is king. What a weekend. So on that note, we're jumping into the two Ulster football quarterfinals. And, I mean, this was a lot of people's 
result of the weekend. Donegal absolutely stunned Derry, 411 to 17 points. Watching this game, it just seemed to me like Donegal just figured them out. Jim McGuinness just figured them out and they just cooked Oran Lynch from the kickers. They just caught him again and again and again and again. And I couldn't believe that they kept persisting with it. How many times do you want to get caught? Two, three, four? And especially after the first one in, and then you get caught again, and then he's still coming out. I get that it might be beneficial, but when it feels like Jim has you figured out, when it feels like Donegal have you figured out, change it, man. Because you can't get lobbed from there if your goalkeeper's on the line. I don't see why they kept persisting on playing Russian roulette. And then when the Jamie Brennan goal went in, that was it. Curtains, Donegal had them figured out and Donegal win. What's coincidental about this game, actually, and uh, our good friend Aaron Prendergast from Gaelic Games Fan TV, checked them out if you haven't already, brilliant to the channel overall. He actually said this was very similar in many ways to the Dublin game in 2014, where Jim McGinnis figured out Dublin. And coincidentally, um, Derry, or Dublin lost by six points. And coincidentally, Dublin scored 17 points that day too. Fate? <laughs> it just is. You know, it, it really is. Um, what a performance on Tony Garland. To be honest, I expected Tony Gall to put it up to Derry because of what Jim McGuinness has done with the team. I didn't expect him to win. I did not expect them to win by six. This was just an unreal showing um, from a Tony Gall team. And the, the Jamie Brennan goal in particular was just, from a Derry point of view, I think he would over Lynch. Just stop now. Please don't yeah. do this again. You know, it's just, it's just like, it's just like Gaelic football suicide, isn't it, Seamus? Because you just can't keep doing that again and again. And I counted for for three of the four goals. They were the exact same scenario. Orange yeah. coming out of the goal and And it was always that happens. Just, one just one kick out. And not even just from Sean Patton, but Mourinho, the subkeeper that came in. Just from his kick out too. And I was like, I don't see why you're persisting with this. Because Donegal doesn't, it doesn't seem to stop Donegal from doing what they want to do. It's actually like, they're like, oh, here he comes. All right, we're going to run it now. And then Derry just kept playing into their hands. And like for Mickey Hart in particular, you've got someone like Jim McGuinness there who, let's be real, the minute that draw was made, Jim McGuinness didn't care about the league. It was all about Mickey Hart and that Ulster quarterfinal. So for Mickey Hart, what I would be thinking is if he gets the first scare with Lynch, the first scare, you need to be able to take a look at that and go, that didn't happen by accident. McGuinness is a genius. He planned that to go like this. He knows that I bring Lynch up. He knows that Lynch pushes up and he's got a tactic for it. So the first time that Donegal score a goal from it, stop doing it because McGuinness knows that you're doing this and he has a perfect plan to take full advantage of it. But they kept persisting with it. Okay, the second time isn't enough. How about Jamie Brennan's goal? And that was it. And if Derry continued to do this, it's not the first time they've been caught. Oran Lynch got mm-hmm. lobbed in the All-Ireland semi-final of 2022. Remember that, Damien Comer? Yeah. So this isn't the first time it's happened to them. And I will be very, very interested to see if Mickey Hart persists with it over the rest of the year, because McGuinness, I think, has just exposed a massive flaw in that system. What the massive flaw is, and uh, the over Lynch coming out of the goal, was actually when Derry pushed up, Tony Gall, Gavin Mulroney, or um, Sean Patton, whoever was in goal, OK, I'm, okay cool, push up, I'm going to kick it long here. Yeah. And I'm going to let someone else pat it on. It's almost so similar to the Dublin Tony Gall game in 2014. It's unbelievable. Because yeah. Donegal were managed by Jim McGuinness. They set over the plan. And that plan, again, was to kick the ball over the press. Surely Mickey Hart would have seen um, tapes of that um, kind of ambush that Jim McGuinness uh, planted on uh, on Dublin that day. So you're thinking, would have experienced manager like Mickey Hart as well with the um, with the Darrow Buil goes, OK, there were two in the first half. There's no time to talk to Or Lynch during the first half. But for the Jamie Brennan goal, surely Mickey Hart would have took Or Lynch aside and said, don't do that again. Jimmy yeah. Guinness has us figured out here. But they, 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 they do it again. It's just like, it's, it's just, and you mentioned it perfectly there, Ru- Russian roulette. It's just yeah. stupid, really. And there is a time to bring out your goalkeeper, and it is the evolution of the modern-day goalkeeper. But there is a time 
to play it safe. And surely Mickey Hart would have known that. It was just, you know, it was really, really bad defensively from a Derry point of view. And even, like, attack-wise, only Eaton Doherty really shot the lights over for Derry with four points. Shane McGuigan was kept tabs on all night by mm-hmm. Donegal. Brilliant performance with the defence there. And not much of the, the Derry team. Co- didn't hear quiet. anything from Glass. Didn't hear anything from Brendan Rogers. really. He got a couple of nice points, but... <laughs> He was well marshaled. McGuigan, as you said, outstanding job. I think it was Brendan McCall that was on him. Just shut down. And like, you look at some of the performances, like, you know, performances from the likes of Jason McGee, Quayla McGonagall was fantastic. Darrell Boyle with the two goals, just sensational. To do it once is incredible. To do it twice is, that's not a, a fluke. That's it. You have that down to a fine art. And um, what... An unbelievable goal as well by Jamie Brennan right at the end, like to finish it like that. Stockholm Tim says Derry dropped about 10 short into the goalkeeper as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, like there just wasn't the day for them. And then on top of that, about time someone took advantage of this stupid fly goalie rubbish. I mean, when you look at it like this, Dublin don't do that. Dublin have never mm. gone with this. And I'm not saying Dublin are perfect. But you would look at it and think, why haven't Dublin done it? Why haven't Dublin moved with this new tactic? And why haven't, like, say, Kerry don't do it that often? Uh, To be fair, Seamus, they do, to be fair. Shane Ryan. Yeah, I know. Shane Ryan comes up, but nowhere near as much as Lynch. Yeah. And, like, like, the reality is, is that I would look at it and say, Cluxton plays more of a quarterback role. I think, personally, that's the perfect role for the goalkeeper to play. A quarterback role, you can go back to me if you need to. I'm going to sit here and spray the ball out. That's the the perfect role, in my opinion, for a goalkeeper to play. Because when you have someone like, for example, you know, Rory Began, who's able to move out, that's fine. But when you get caught, you get caught. And it's for the maximum penalty. And it like Derry got caught. And it it did, you are right, it did remind me of the, the Dublin game in 2014 because it was like it was like as if Donegal were like the underdog boxer, if you like, coming up against a you know very imperious, imposing, undefeated contender. And it was like Donegal landed three or four knockout blows, like really, really hard shots that you know you're looking at thinking, I don't know, I think that's it for Derry. Like I think Donegal just had them figured out. I really, really do think they just had them figured out. You see how Jim McGuinness has beaten Mickey Hart time and time again. It's not a coincidence. I think Jim knows fine well. Mickey won't change his tactics. Mickey goes with what he thinks his game plan is. And if he gets it right, he sticks with it. If he gets it wrong, he sticks with it. I mean, we've seen it time and time again with Mickey. When he loses, he loses bad. Do you remember 2017? 2017, Dublin played Tyrone in the All-Ireland semi-final. Dublin had that blanket defence figured out. They boxed them in. And Tyrone had no plan B. And that was, you know, one of Dublin's best performances that I've seen, but it also didn't help that Tyrone had no second card to play. Yeah. And by this as well, Derry were shown very clear evidence that they were going to get caught for this long kick out um, with Sean Patton. They were shown very clear evidence that if you keep bringing Lynch out, you're going to get caught. They were caught and they decided to, to risk it again. And like, I don't understand why. And... Yeah, just where where does this go from here? Where does this go for Donegal? Uh, like, are they nailed on now, Ulster? You know, is not well, Ulster's completely up in the air now. I'd say Tyrone would have been buzzing when they seen that result. Um, and then on top of that, you look at where do Derry go from here? How do they bounce back? And let's let's be honest as well. Can we stop with this nonsense? People being like, oh well. They didn't want to win the provincial championship. That's just ridiculous. There was saying it on RT as well. Colin Cooper brought it up um, after the Ross Common game and said, "Oh well, maybe Ross Common didn't and Ross Common didn't want to win, or he's going down that path." And Sean Kavanagh cut across him and was like, "You never go out to lose a game. Will you stop?" Yeah. Like, and people have acted like I, it's my pet hate, man, because. People have acted like because Dublin won the All Ireland last year that it's reduced to this fine art. Oh, Dublin timed it to perfection. It's just that's a load of waffle. Dublin hit form at the right time, but you can't be like, oh, now we're going to start winning. It, it doesn't work like that. 
it doesn't work like that. Derry got figured out. Derry got yeah. figured out. You can't put any excuses down of they didn't want to win Ulster. Of course they wanted to win Ulster. You think Mickey Hart doesn't want to win Ulster? Of course he does. They got figured out, and now they have to go the, the other route. I'd be interested to see how they bounce back because they really got hit hard in this one. What is another angle to this game as well? Mickey Hart's record against Jim McGuinness is absolutely horrendous when yeah. you look at it. So you're thinking, surely Mickey Hart will have it in in himself to say, I'm going to beat Jim McGuinness here. And actually, this is the first that I've heard of a few shames about Cole Cooper's comments because I was watching the Cork and Watford game on GA Go and I was watching Dan and Dallas, so I wasn't watching Mayo and Ross Common and Alice as much with Kevin and uh, Cooper. And I would say to you, that is absolute... Uh, you know, he wasn't trash. saying it a hundred percent, but I think like I think it was Joanne, it was Sean, and it was Colum, and that they were speculating on why Ross Common didn't play to the best of their abilities. And I think it got floated as like a potential reason, and Sean just cut it dead. Sean was like, "That's nonsense. You never go out to lose a provincial game." So they they were basically saying. If Kerry lost to Cork now yesterday, they, they would say, oh, yeah, Kerry wanted to lose that game to push forward in the all Ireland." How does that mean? Does that mean? Yeah, everybody's been doing that in Leinster for the last 14 years. Everybody else is only copping on to it now. It comes from people who don't want to accept that they got figured out. Yeah, I think mean, that's, that's the truth of it. Yeah, but the thing is, like, yeah, uh, uh, one more point to this game, like, yeah, uh, Derry, this w- might set them back a uh, bit, bit now because they'd have to go back to the drawing board. But then again, it could be a blessing in disguise for Derry because you look, they have a month now to prepare for the All Irelands, and they might go over and they might go over tactics with Or Lynch and say, look, this didn't work against Donegal. You could do it against teams that were kind of expected to beat, let's say, mm. in, in the All Ireland, like a Meath or like a Cork or like a Clare. But if you're doing it against Donegal and Kerry or, or Dublin, don't do it because yeah. you're going to get found out, especially with Jim McGuinness there about and everything like that. But what this win will do for Donegal, I think it's massive for them. Huge. No, because I do, I do remember thinking that. I remember watching the league final and Lynch seemed like he had a mistake in him. And he'd been caught before. Like against Galway, he was caught. And he got caught multiple times in this game. Yeah, and that was that was the way with Derry, and it was just, you know, it was a terrible day out for them. But then again, you could just say they had a rough day out. Move on to the next game now. Brush this performance under the carpet. Obviously, look at the analysis boys and see what, what you actually did wrong against Jim McGuinness and Tony Gall. But improve the next day. You have a month mm-hmm. now to improve, and that's what Derry will be focused on. But if Tony Gall were to win an Ulster Championship in Jim McGuinness's first year as a, in his second term. That would be yeah. some job he's doing at the moment. Because you think he's look gonna at do Tony Gall. Who's going to win Ulster now? I think Tony Gall will, to be honest with you. Because when you look at it, down aren't up to the level. Tyrone, I think, are really, really poor. I think they're overrated. And Armagh, look, Armagh have the potential to do it, but Armagh will do an Armand. <laughs> That's my honest, honest view on it. But. <laughs> But, um, but I think I think Tony Gall are massive favourites. But before we move on to um, Tyrone and Cavan, what I will say about Jim McGuinness to perform as he's done so far to win the Division Two title over Arbaugh, to beat Derry in the Ulster quarter final, and to get promotion all in the same season already. Already, look at Tony Gall last season compared to this season. This is an outstanding job he's doing at the moment, and he deserves a lot of praise for it. He certainly does. And Stockton and Tim says here, Donegal can improve too. They left a fair few wides behind them from scorable positions. That is true. And they still have McBrady to come back in, a fully fit McBrady. I know he came off the bench, but he definitely isn't that full fitness. So they can only get better as well, which is absolutely crazy. Then Stockton and Tim says as well, if anybody tries it against Donegal, again, they'll be punished. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, Donegal have shown that if you try and move the keeper up, they have the perfect game plan to get around that. An FPL lad says, what happens to teams knocked out in the quarterfinals of Ulster? So if they are below the Sam Maguire Cup competitions, then they go into the Tolton Cup. If they are in the Division 1, Division 2 with their All-Ireland play secured, they go into the All-Ireland group stages next. So, I mean, Derry have a lot of time to lick their wounds. 
Um, we'll go on to the next game then. Cavan 316, Tyrone 123 after extra time in Breffney Park. What an absolute thriller this one was. I mean, right down to the very last second, this game was hanging in the balance. Cavan sensed that they had an upset potentially on the cards here against the Division 1 side. They were right in that suspicion. Um, I predicted that Tyrone would win. I said that Derek Hanavan would drag them through. That's what I predicted would happen here. Cavan certainly made them pay for this one. They did. That's, yeah, it was a, just a mental game altogether. And, uh, I think it set a few flaws at the Toronto team. And I've said this time and time again, and Toronto fans don't listen. You're overrated. Look at the performance today. I I will say, that, look, Cavan performed well, but Cavan had chances to win that game. And I will say they had a goal chance to win it right at the death and extra time. If they took that, we could have been talking about a different story here. So, mm -hmm. Tyrone have a lot of work to do. And I think Brian Dewar knew that, even looking at his uh, post-match kind of expressions at the end of the game on BBC2 Northern Ireland. It looked like he was just saying, get back in the dressing room now, lads. Get back. Don't celebrate mm -hmm. this victory because we've done it all next week and we perform really bad here. That was the kind of attitude with Tyrone. They performed terribly in the last few minutes. They allowed Cavan back into the game. They were six points up. They should have won the game. But then, it, fair play to Cavan for coming back into it. And they produced an outstanding performance. They just tired in the end. And it was just unfortunate. But then again, even with Cavan being tired, they could have won the game. Like They could have even drawn the game. They could have won the game at the last minute goal chance. And then the point, they just had to hand pass the ball forward and not go back out of the 45 and they would have got a shot and goal. And it was just it was just a really, really um, a tough one to take for Cavan. They'll move it to the all Ireland series. I think they're guaranteed an all Ireland place. No one has to double check now. But um, but it was a tough one to take for Cavan. As for Tyrone, Derek Hanavan got seven points. Matty Donnelly had a very good performance, to be fair to him. Coming back from an ACL injury and doing well at centre-back deserves a lot of praise, to be fair to him. But uh, I would say this, Tyrone, they aren't going anywhere. And I've said this to many Tyrone um, on many channels before, and Tyrone fans complained to me about this, I said Tyrone are not winning the Ireland. They're going nowhere near it. And this performance just epitomised that. And I think Donegal will be... Look at that game today, I think Donegal will kind of be licky in their lips look it's wrong. Do you know what was the main thing I noticed from that game was just looking at their team, it's so different to their 2021 team. Like, there's so many players missing. Like, I think that, that is questionable when you look at kind of why are all these players stepping away? Obviously, we were, on the preview, we were told that David Mulgrew had stepped away and then there was someone else that stepped away. Well, Michael Mike McLean. McLean, yeah, had stepped away. That's You could make a very good starting 15 out of Tyrone lads that aren't playing for Tyrone. You could make an Inter-County Division 2 team out of it, I'd say. So, Tyrone definitely, there's... There's a bit of head scratch that needs to go on as to like how can we get all these lads back in and get our strongest panel there. Um, but the reality is, look, you do have to say they still made it through. Like Cavan did put it up to them and they still made it through. So like there was good performances up front from the likes of Dara Canavan that did play a big part in them getting through this one. Yeah, you might have to give them credit for that in fairness. But, um, but yeah, it was still... Like, they were six points up. Cavan did very well to get back into the game. And Paddy Lynch, and even though Paddy Lynch's influence, like Oshie Brady had a very good performance. So did Key and Matt in a corner forward. And they were very good. Noel Carroll got a brilliant goal as well. But I will say, looking at the black and white, there were six points up thrown. How mm -hmm. on earth could you let that slip? Against, let's, let's be real, this is a Cavan team that got hammered by Armagh in Division 2. Mm -hmm. And Drew to Mead, who got hammered then by Dublin in Leinster. Like, I mean, and, and what, I'm, what I'm saying, okay, in the context of Ulster, Tyrone could go on and win it with a bit of luck there. They could go on and win it. But some Tyrone fans are going on about they'll win the All Ireland this year. Look at that performance today. They will yeah. get nowhere near the All Ireland, James. They won't, simple as. I think in Ulster, if they get a bit of luck, they could even get through with the next round against Donegal, but they need a massive amount of luck as far as I'm concerned. Like Donegal looked like real perennial contenders now last night. Tyrone didn't look at it at all today. So like it's going to be a tough one for Tyrone to come over next week, but uh, 
But look, they got through. They got over the line in the end with a bit of luck on their side. And um, yeah, that's all the matters, I suppose. Yeah, like there's no doubt. Like Jim will have his research done on Donegal, no question about it. But I always do wonder when you put so much on the first game and you get through it, do you not have as much done on the second game? Like if Donegal were aiming for Derry so much, like Tyrone next. Look, Jim definitely always wants to be Tyrone. Like he pretty much highlighted that in his book. He always wants to be Tyrone. He always seen them as the kings of Ulster. So I think Donegal probably will shade that one. But... I think Tyrone have the forwards to give them enormous problems. And I would say that they're a very dangerous underdog going into that game. Moving across to the Connacht Championship, one team that was definitely an underdog, but definitely performed above and beyond what people expected of them. And were so close to pulling off a huge shock with Sligo. Sligo, 14 points. Galway, 113 in Markovic Park. Galway, very lucky to get out of this one. Really, really lucky. And uh, Galway only laid an additional time through that Robert Finnerty goal. And it was just heartbreak for Sligo. I see the clip from John Gillespie, uh, PRO, the Galway PRO, and uh, Twitter, if you haven't checked it out already. The goal for Robert Finnerty, it was just heartbreak. You could see the Sligo players just collapsing on the floor and they were just like, oh no. Like yeah. that must have been so sickening for them um, to lead so... Um, at so many facets of the game and then for Galway to get that goal through the end. And uh, Damien Comer, to be fair to him, came on the pitch, got a bit of an influence going there. Robert Finnerty, uh, as far as I uh, could see, scored 1-4 from play. So to be fair, he had a very good performance and got Galway back into it. Shane Walsh was very disappointing. One point on his return. And you could say he was poured off and Sligo shackled him really, really well. But for Sligo, the spread of scores for the underdog was absolutely superb, I have to say, from a um, Sligo point of view. I think they had nine different scores, which was brilliant. So, like, Sligo could come away from this game with their head held high. They performed absolutely brilliantly. Wasn't enough, though. I think, look at the Tats of Cup, though, for Sligo. At the same time, they'd be looking at it and thinking, we can go on and win this. Because we have the players to do it. We've shown that we can compete at the top level here. And yeah, it shows that the provincial championships aren't dead when a Division 3 team, a, a progressing Division 3 team, can put it up to a Division 1 team. It was a brilliant performance for Sligo. Heartbreak at the end, though. And uh, we see another celebration. We thought Tom O'Connell's celebration for Watford a few weeks ago was a bit um, obscure. Uh, wait till you see Robert Finnerty's one. It was the Cole Palmer celebration. So wait till you watch that on the Sunday game tonight. Certainly, and I think everybody here will be tuning in in about 20 minutes. We'll have this wrapped up by the time the Sunday game comes around. I won't be keeping you away from your TV screens. Um, yeah, we've commented in here from Sam McGowan. He's talking about the Derry Donegal game. He says Derry gifted Donegal nine points with the keeper mistakes. Without that, Derry outscored Donegal and win the game. Don't be losing the run of yourselves. But the reality is, Donegal had Derry figured out on the goalkeeping plan. That's a major part of Mickey Hart's system. So Derry will need to go back to the drawing board on some level after that because when Dublin got beaten by Donegal, when Dublin got basically hammered by Donegal with the Ryan McHugh goals, Jim Gavin changed everything about the way that Dublin played and then Dublin went on for that run of success. I'm not saying that Derry are crap. I'm not saying that Derry are useless. I still think they're all Ireland contenders, but they will have to take a good, hard look at that Oron Lynch tactic. Is it worth the risk? My opinion, no, it's not. I don't think it's worth the risk because I think in a game like that in an All Ireland final, I think you could get caught out. My advice: go closer to what Kerry do with Shane Ryan, maybe something like that. Maybe don't go all the way back to what Dublin do with Stephen Cluxton, but stop playing like you're a centre half forward. You're not. You're a goalkeeper, and you got caught out multiple times. <laughs> not just in this game, but against Galway in the semi final, and I think there was a league game where he got caught as well. Was that against Kerry this year? Uh, I think Conor it was Ganey. actually, yeah, yeah. Conor yeah. Ganey, yeah. So, like, we've been seeing this coming. So, like, yeah, I, I think Mickey Hart needs to really have a look at it. I don't think it's worth continuing with personally myself. Now, but for Sligo as well, like, I mean, going back to that before we move off this game, it's a massive, massive positive note as well. I know that they lost, but for Tony McEntee to honestly sit there and say, you got beaten by so much last year. Galway swept Sligo aside in the Connacht final last year. Yeah. Sligo have really closed that gap. They have. And it's just a credit to the Sligo team board ending. And uh, 
there was question marks whether Sligo would put it up to them, and I was questioning could Sligo actually do it. But then when I see Damien Comer, Shane Walsh on the team, I was thinking, okay, God, we could wrap this up pretty handily now. But Sligo, to be fair to them, what a performance! And they should be very, very proud of themselves, as I said. And uh, look at the Tadson Cup now with the teams that are in it. You look at Fermanagh, possibly Down, possibly Westmeath being in as Kildare. So like Sligo, I know their their sides that were higher than them in the league. But they would fancy their chances of winning this competition out of the Hatton Cup because they look mm-hmm. really good, they look really sharp. And then um, they have a lot of different scores. They don't just have one standout player like many other underdogs do. They have Noel Murphy, they have Sean Carbine, who's only scored one point in this game, which shows the spread of scores across the team. They have Pat Spillane, they have Patrick O'Connor, who had a really good performance. Um, yesterday as well, Mikey Gordon. So Sligo do have some very excellent players there. And I think they'll be dark horse for the Tata Cup. I really do. I think they could even go on and win that competition. And it shows as well, I know they'll be disappointed after yesterday. The players will be absolutely crestfallen to lose to a last-minute goal in the manner that they did through Robert Finnerty. But there has to be a sense of pride in that Sligo performance as well. And I think the Sligo supporters will think the same thing. They are going to be proud of their players this weekend and no doubt about it. Yeah, certainly. I mean, they're definitely making progress. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the other Connacht semi-final then, Mayo beat Ross Common with kind of minimal fuss. To be honest, I was watching this game. one fifteen to Mayo, 13 points to Ross Common in Dr. Hyde Park. And um, yeah, the goal came from Aidan O'Shea quite early on. And, you know, Ross Common never really, in my head, I never really thought Ross Common were going to win. Like, I thought Ross Common did, you know, have some good spells, some nice points from Ben O'Carroll. Dermot Murta especially kicked some lovely scores in the first half. But particularly in the final quarter, Mayo powered on. And uh, really left Ross Common for dirt. I think it, the yeah. other thing as well is that Mayo do have a lot of stuff to improve on as well, which I think is probably the perfect spot for Max Day to be in, is that, you know, he does have things to work on, yet it's a five-point victory over a side who beat them in the Connacht Championship last season. The weird kind of or of results continue, doesn't it? Because like Mayo seemed to do well in the Hyde, Ross Common seemed to do well in Castle Bar. It's just I don't know, it's a bit weird. But uh, anyway, look, um, I watched it as Carter by eye off, so I was watching Cork and Waterford in full. But as soon as the goal went in for me, no shame, it was almost like Ross Common kind of it was almost too easy for Mayo, which was kind of a worry from a Ross Common point of view. I thought there'd be much more fight than there was. But um but yeah, very good performance for Mayo to be fair. Brian who's seven points, Fergal Boland, Conor Loftus came on and did well. But um, other than Darrell Craig and Durbin Burton, there didn't seem to be much out of Ross Common, which was a big shame from them more than anything. And especially in the performance of the league, like it was just, it was almost like they were busted flush. And ever since the Cork game last year, the championship where they lost in Park and Keeve, they haven't really recovered since then, which is kind of a worry mm. for Davy Burke. So, um, so yeah, for Mayo, they're in some kind of final now. I think this is their first kind of final since 2015, if you disregard COVID. So they want to just brush that stat under the under the bat. They have done that now. Can they go on and win the Connacht title? Even look at Galway's performance yesterday. I think Mayo will fancy that. I think that's what Mayo needs. That's what Kevin McStay needs to go on and um, um, be counted for all our glory alongside the likes of Derry, Kerry and Dublin, potentially Donegal as well. So, yeah, it was a good, good win for Mayo. Wasn't the best performance, but to be honest, look at this. I'd be more disappointed to know Ross Common turned up. It was a bit of a bit of a bad showing from them. Yeah, and then um on the Connacht final then, because it is, you know, the arch rivals, Mayo and Galway, who are in the Connacht final, two, you know, not a million dollar performances in the Connacht semi-finals, but yet two victories and they're into the final. Who do you see being probably the favourites as of right now on the 21st of April? You'll get the two semi-finals, uh, Mayo. How easy they put Ross Common away. I think Mayo will be favourites to win it. And uh, but look at their league last year, their league form. It, like to be honest, they beat Kerry and Canary. Didn't know there was poor performance. And again, similar to Ross Common, ever since the car came, they didn't really recover. I know they beat Galway, but then Dublin was very poor. But Mayo did show glimpses, especially in Canary and today as well, what they are capable of with the players they, they have got and the manager they've got kept next day. So I think Mayo will be favourites going to the Connacht final in a few weeks' time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I probably would agree with you. I have picked Mayo to win the Connacht Championship. At the start, I'm certainly not seeing anything from Galway that makes you want to change 
that prediction. We're going to move down south then, the Munster Senior Football Championship semi final. Kerry, 18 points. Cork, 112 at Fitzgerald Stadium in the blistering sunshine down south. I mean, that definitely felt like a championship game between Kerry and Cork in terms of the, you know, the weather and everything like that. Cork came out and gave it a right good go. Paul Walsh with an early goal. Cork got off to a great start. Kerry were in a game throughout. And I think one of the, one of the, kind of most impressive things for Cork is like how much Jack O'Connor had to call upon people like Stephen O'Brien, Paul Ganey, and he had to call upon them quite early as well. Um, I think Kerry were slightly surprised at the level that Cork came at. I think Cork gave them a right good game. Kerry ultimately came out on top. Yeah, it was, a, it was kind of a weird game from a Kerry point of view. It was just a you know, even in the last few minutes, they had to hold out Cork. They held the ball for five minutes before getting the free. Yeah. And there was actually it, there was actually booing around the stadium from Kerry's own supporters. They didn't like mm-hmm. this style of football. It was almost like that's what Cork could have um, put them down to. And to be fair to John Cleary, so they did very well in the first half. Paul Watch's goal, as he mentioned. And then even looking back at the first half highlights on GA goal there, and what I would say, GA goal is very good to look back, even when you're going to the game and go back over the highlights. It's absolutely brilliant to service to have. Looking at that, Connor Carver could have had a goal. Chris Oak Jones could have had a goal. Like, Carr could have had about three or four goals in that first half. Simple as. Yeah. And that would be a worry from a carrying point of view. But also positive from Cork that they are producing these goal chances against a, decent, a very good carry side that are obviously going to be on the cusp of an all the title. And Cork did very well in Verdus in the first half. In the second half, I think they made an error, really, of judgment with uh, John Cleary, actually. He actually let, said to the players, push back, let Kerry come on to us. And to be honest, I think Cork should have pushed up on them more in all mm-hmm. honesty, if we did, we could have got more joy. But look, they'll learn on the job now. They'll go into the All Ireland series with a bit of confidence. And to lose the three points against Kerry, a side like Kerry, isn't um, at all bad from a, a car point of view. It does show that we are kind of a weird team in, in, in some aspects. We are a better team than me. We are a better team than Cavan. We are a better team than those. But we have to produce it in a regular kind of standpoint when you look mm-hmm. at Division 2 next season, we have to beat these teams because we sh- we shown yesterday against Kerry, we could produce a good performance against him. We beat Mayo, we beat Ross Common. We, were, we did an inch of a post to beating Dublin last year in the league. We are capable of good performances, but we have to produce it more on a consistent basis. But what I will say um, from one particular guy, Daniel O'Mahony from Cork, brilliant Fantastic. performance from him, unreal. And he did very well against David Clifford, didn't he, that... I think it was three interceptions in a row off the best footballer um, to ever live nearly. Mm-hmm. But this was just brilliant from Daniel. And um, yeah, he's just a brilliant player from Nottingham Green, the car carry border. And a uh, bit of a staff here there, or a bit of a fact here that many people might not know. He's actually Aiden O'Mahony's nephew, the legend for Kerry. So we're, we're actually lucky to have him. He's an unbelievable player. And um, yeah, really good performance from Cork. And uh, we'll go into the all Ireland series with a bit of confidence. And one thing I will say, Seamus, as well, there was a bit of disappointment throughout the stadium, the fact that this was only a semi-final. I know we'll get out to Clare mm. Watford a bit, but even Kerry fans were thinking, this should have been a final because Carr yeah. put it up to us. It was a great day in Killarney, brilliant championship atmosphere, but you have the feeling, you know, Kerry against Clare in a few weeks would be a bit of a dead rubber. Yeah, hopefully not. We're, we're going to jump into that game next. A couple of comments in here about the game. Joseph Nash says here, Kerry will be happy that Cork have done their yearly job in giving them a good game on in the championship. And then we have FPL lad says, was at the Cork v Kerry game. I'm a Cork fan, but how come Stephen Sherlock never seems to start? One of the best players in Cork with the bars. I don't understand why he never starts. Matthew, what would you take beyond that? Well, how come Sherlock never gets the run? Because it's almost like a situation with Lampard and Gerrard in um, the England team and the golden generation. They can't start the same team. It's Brian Hurley mm-hmm. and Stephen Sherlock. I don't think they can start the same team. It's either one or the other because both of them are free takers. They're decent enough free takers. They're high scores and things like that. But what you need around the, one of these type of players is a bit of speed. And Chris O'Jones jones has it. Conor Garvin has it. Um, you have big pillars in the half hour nine as well the likes of Paul Walsh the likes of Brian O'Driscoll and you have Sean Powder workhorse centre forward so to be honest with you I do agree with you I think Stephen Sherlock is an excellent player but I just don't think Sherlock and Hurley can start on the same team that's honestly the reason why they don't start on the same team and John Cleary has to make that uh, bold decision 
Yeah, no, it definitely is a brave one to make when you consider Sherlock's form for the bars and everything like that. Mm. But yeah, we it is a repeat of the Munster football final from last season. Uh, Waterford won nine, Clare two twenty. The dream wasn't to be. Waterford obviously captured everybody's hearts with the victory over Tipperary and had us all knowing that they were seventy minutes away from Sam Maguire Cup football, which would have been sensational. But Clare had other ideas and absolutely put a beat down on Waterford two twenty to one nine in Fraher Field. It is the banner who will be joining Kerry in the Munster final. Yeah, it was a good performance from Clare. He got over the line. The end. Aaron Griffin with five points from play, and he was the top scorer from play in Division Three as well. So carrying good form into the Munster final. To be fair to him, Emma McMahon as well. Mark McAdory, good performances. But um, yeah, Clare just a much better team than Waterford. And you said it there. The dream has died. Um, you look for Watford they got the win over Tipperary I think that was kind of the height of their expectations but for Clare and I will say this good performance for Clare I'm not taking you away from it Ebbett McMahon was brilliant Darren Griffin all them they were brilliant uh, performers but what I will say it does highlight a few things wrong with the championship that Clare get into the all Ireland series by beating Watford the worst team in the league whereas mm-hmm. Down have to face the likes of Armagh a tough trip against Antrim as well and they get nothing. They get the Tata yeah. Cup. It's just, I think, hey, Seamus, and I don't want to be mean to Claire, I just think it's unfair. It really is unfair. And look, that's that's the championship we are. We are stuck with, unfortunately. But um, I think, honestly, the next few weeks, Kerry against Claire. Unfortunately for Claire, I think it'll be a washout in a few weeks' time. And it's just unfortunate that it's got to this. Yeah, well, like Kerry beat them by what, 15 points, 16 yeah. points last year. And that was when Clare had far like a far better team on paper. I know that they've been playing really well. Stockholm Tim says big score from Clare, doing well after all they've lost since last year. I mean, obviously Colin Collins in the eleven players that left the team, like a sensational number of players departed the panel in the off season. Yeah, like just for Waterford, look, hold your head high. You've had a good year. Um, don't really think people could have anticipated that you would have beaten Tipperary and everything like that. Paul Shanky doing a very, very good job there as Waterford boss. Stockroom Tim says, let's not forget that Clare were robbed of promotion after being denied a perfectly legitimate goal versus Westmead. Yeah, that's the other, obviously, element that is there as well. But it's the fact that Waterford could have jumped into the All-Ireland Championships that also does highlight kind of a bit of a flaw in the system. But, you know, obviously, if you're watching this, myself, Matthew and Aaron have a video dropping this Tuesday, which is talking about ideas that the three of us have that could be good in the GA. So solutions to fix, like a new calendar, you know, new content and promotion ideas and everything like that. And we've all backed the senior, intermediate and junior championship structures. It just seems to be the most obvious thing in the world. It's in every club championship. It's in every, you know, uh, other championship apart from men's Gaelic football. So I think it's about time we implement it in as well. Now, moving on to the LGFA Provincial Championships. They kicked off over the weekend as well. We have two games in Munster, two games in Leinster. The Munster Championship round one. Cork got a much-needed victory over Waterford in Dungarvan, won 10 to 11 points. And Kerry beat Tipperary 214 to 5 points at Fitzgerald Stadium. So a good start for the Rebels and the Kingdom. Yeah, massive. And what I will say, uh, another suggestion in that video a few we- in a few days' time is uh, the double headers. And there was a double header uh, this week. I think you'd be delighted to know, Seamus. There was Kerry and Tipperary, the ladies, before the Kerry and Cork game. I obviously. I, I didn't get into the yeah. ladies on time, but I did speak to a few Kerry fans and they just said that uh, Tipperary had a similar situation to Derry, coincidentally. The goalkeeper actually came out of the goal and Louise de Verhertley scored an easy goal at the end of the mm. first half and it just set Kerry along their way. Um, and uh, Emil, Emil Emil Dineen actually, actually, Waterford. Yeah. Waterford, men's hurlers, Walsh Park, men's footballers, Fryerfield, LGFA, Dungavon. Why? <laughs> Why? Why not at least just one double header, please? Just one game. Well, there, there was a double header. I, I think there was a double header. Was there Doug Garvin, Watford, Carkins, Watford, Clare? Mm, I'm not sure. Hopefully, I think There's there was. Between but... Garvin and Walsh Park. Walsh Park is. Wait a minute. Fraherfield is done Garvin. So for if Fraherfield is Dungarvan. So Fraherfield was Watford and Cork, and Fraherfield was definitely Clare and Watford. So I think there okay. was a double header there last night. So yeah, that, 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 
that was a praise in fairness. Like they were say both were semi finals and you know, most are actually doing very well in fairness. And they're going to do Kabogi games in the next few weeks as well, which is great to see. But uh, after they carry in Tipperary game, it was it was just uh, that goal at the end of the first half from the Verhurtig just turned the tight at its head. And uh, what I would say, Daniel O'Leary was brilliant for Kerry eight points in this game. So very good uh, win for Kerry, but for Tipperary, looked at go on to the next few games. Kind of hoping that they'll get more joy out of the next few games. They were well in it in the first half, and then Kerry just breezed past them in the second half. As for the other game, huge win for Cork because that was six losses in a row in the league. They badly needed that win against Watford. They got us Laura Maddy get that uh, crucial goal, and Katie Cork coming back into the team with five points, and it probably proves she's so crucial to this Cork team. If you have her, anything can happen. So good win for Cork, good confidence booster, Kerry. They're all earned favourites for a reason, and that was a performance that won't um, harm them in any way. Certainly won't. Stockroom Tim here says, lads, the hurling coverage on TV is a joke. We have a short season and only one game on national TV this weekend. Again, we discuss all about the ideas we'd like to see implemented from a coverage aspect in that video. It drops on Tuesday across all three of our channels as well, so no excuse to miss it. Um, yeah, we're going to go into the Leinster games then. Leinster round one. We had Dublin beating Kildare 4-15 to 2-4 in Parnell Park and Meath beating Leash 3-11 to 1-7 in Park Talton. So dominant victories for the last two counties to win the senior LGFA All-Ireland Championships. Dublin and Meath really, really flexing their muscles in these two games. I was surprised because of the, you know, the run of form that Kildare had been on. I thought that they'd be a little bit more tricky for Dublin, but Dublin really showed them the levels. Meath did the same with Leash as well. Yeah, it was just uh, kind of crashing back down to earth for Kildare, and it's just unfortunate because Kildare had a really, really good run, run with the likes of Roisin Byrne and Nasa Dooley performing well, but they were just knocked out of it to the brilliant performance of Dublin and it just shows they're a serious team and Mick Bowen's charges like Carla Rogan in one four or the Nolan one three brilliant performance for Kate Sullivan and Quivo O'Connor getting the others Hannah Terry getting four points it was just a brilliant day at the office for Dublin and then move on to the next day you now and as for me what I will say Marion Farrelly is really impressed me this year she did very well in the league she scores 2-2 today as well Really good performance, and Emma Duggan scoring one four. So they're coping well without Vicky Ward, without um, Orla Lally, without Nevo Sullivan. They are doing well, being in fairness. The asset test though will be against Dublin in a few weeks' time in the Leinster group. But good win for me and an impressive win for Dublin. Certainly, and then with the news as well that came out on Thursday that Sinead Goldrick is returning to the Dublin team. Yeah. I mean. That is a massive boost for Dublin in their quest to defend the All-Ireland Championships. So that is the weekend wrapped up. We had a fantastic weekend of action. Guys, thank you so much to anybody who put in a live comment. Really, really do appreciate all the support and all the comments and all the engagement in the chats as well. Do watch League Sunday. Enjoy League No, not League Sunday. What am I talking about? It's been a long day. Do watch the Sunday game and enjoy the Sunday game. Uh, from myself and from Matthew, until the next video here on Unclear, Torah.